on the nature and character of God. And I think uh, before we get into it, I think I have some bad news for Eli and for uh, Cole up there. And that is that my iPad, which is supposed to work as a remote, is not connecting to my computer. So you're going to have to hit the space bar to advance uh, the slides when I tell you uh, next slide, okay? So the space bar or the right arrow key, either one of those will work. Yeah? Good? All right. Awesome. So we are looking at the nature and character of God, and we are looking at three, uh, three of God's characteristics. And, and remember, we are in the, the bottom part. Well, we'll get, we'll get there in a moment. Um, First, uh, we need to, as always, we're going to take a look at this infographic. So if you move ahead two slides, we'll look at this infographic about uh, the nature and character of God. And we will, as always, say uh, thank you to Karen Sore, who created uh, the infographics Bible and who created this particular infographic. And, uh, and we will remind ourselves of the structure of this. Now, I realize that in your pews, um, and maybe at home too, it's almost impossible to see all of this in detail because it's too small, but that's why we zoom in from week to week. But if you'll notice, is there a laser pointer on this thing? Ooh, fancy. Look, laser pointer. You won't be able to see that at home, but um, you'll notice that at the, at the top, those are the nature of God things. Those are God's incommunicable attributes. Those are things that are true, holy and totally and completely about God, and they will never be true about us on the same level. We will never be omnipotent. We will never have all the power in the universe and beyond that. We will never be omniscient. We will never know everything. We will never be everlasting, although we will have eternal life given to us by God. But that's a whole different thing because we do have a beginning, whereas God doesn't. We will never be omnipresent. We will never be everywhere at once. We are not infinite in any way, shape, or form, and we are not triune. We are un, just one, right? Uh, that's it. We don't get more of us, right? So those attributes at the top are God's nature, God's incommunicable attributes, and then down at the bottom here are God's uh, elements of God's character. And we've sort of been taking these in chunks. And today we're going to be looking at how God is forgiving and honoring and self-controlled. And, and a couple of, one of those for sure, forgiving, God's forgiving nature is so uh, apparent and clear to us. But then others are perhaps things that we don't think about very often. We don't maybe think about how God is forgiving and self or how God is honoring and self-controlled very often but we're going to look at that today and so as we move to the next slide uh, and we look at God's forgiving nature we are reminded from Daniel chapter 9 verses 8 to 10 uh, where Daniel Daniel has received a vision and learns that the, the people of Israel, their exile is going to last a pretty long time, or what feels like a long time anyways. And, and so Daniel is praying a prayer to God as a result of this vision, uh, and he is praying to God a prayer of repentance, where he, on behalf of himself, and on behalf of the people of Israel, are praying, he is praying that they would be forgiven, that, that, that God would forgive them. And, and as we read part of this prayer, we can hear Daniel's confidence that because of who God is, they will be forgiven, no matter how long the exile might be. So Daniel says, we and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. 
The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. Daniel recognizes that he and and all of his people, his leaders included, have sinned. But he also recognizes that God is merciful and forgiving. And this is something we see time and time and time again in Scripture. That people are forgiven by God. And hopefully it is something that we here in the church, we uh, at home, we wherever we are, it is something that we also have seen and know in our own lives as well. God is forgiving. On our next slide, we can see that God is honoring too, which is sort of weird for us to think about because we know that all glory and honor and praise is due to God alone. That's what the angels say about Jesus in in the book of Revelation when he is found worthy to unroll the scrolls. We find that, that God in Jesus Christ is worthy of that honor. But the reality is, is that God honors people too. As weird as that may sound, God honors people. This is what This is what God says to the people of Israel and Judah in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4. And in this passage, Isaiah is is sharing the words of God as God declares himself to be Israel's only Savior. Right? Isaiah is full of prophetic word and vision, and, and Isaiah is full of... God's wrath, just wrath for the people of Israel, but also it is full of the promise of God's salvation and what God will do for the people of Israel. And in verse 4, we read God saying to the people of Israel, Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Now, it's interesting, and this is a dilemma that we have to wrestle with. It's interesting that none of the people that God honors deserve to be honored by God apart from the work that God has done in them. (laughs) Okay, we're going to have to work through that a little bit. Right? Think about, first of all, people that God has honored. Any of you can um, share who is someone that God honored in Scripture? Abraham, absolutely. God honored Abraham. God, because of his faithfulness, Uh, because of Abraham's faithfulness and his willingness even to sacrifice his one and only son, God honored him with uh, the promise that his, his, his children would outnumber the sand on the seashore or the stars in the heavens. And even now we know from the book of Hebrews that we are Abraham's spiritual descendants. Good, yeah. Who else has God honored? Joseph, absolutely. Joseph had so much integrity, right? And God honored that, right? This integrity to, to, to tell the truth, this integrity to follow God's uh, plan for him, this integrity to resist the temptation of Potiphar's wife, this integrity to tell uh, the hard truth to Pharaoh when it came to interpreting dreams and to give God the glory. Yeah, absolutely, God honored Joseph. Yes. Anybody else? Yeah, David. Mary and Joseph, right? Um, you know, Mary is, is, is known to be the mother of God, right? And, and what a 
huge honor that is. In fact, God, the angel who comes to Mary says that she is blessed and highly favored. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, David is another person whom God honored, right? Uh, we see that in, in the way that, that David is called a man after God's own heart. We see that God honors uh, Paul and the apostles in, in various ways. We see throughout the scriptures faithful people honored by God. But we also see that at the end of time in the book of Revelation when we look uh, you know, at the throne of God and the sea of crystal and all the saints who are around the throne dressed in robes of white, right? We see that God honors them, the martyrs who have given up their lives. God honors those people. And so throughout scriptures, God honors people. But of course, we have to think carefully about that. Why? Why does God honor people? You could say it's because people do great things. That the people who do the great things are the ones whom God honors. And that would be a way too surfacey understanding of why God honors people. Right? Because that gets into this idea that somehow you earn God's favor. That I earn God's salvation. That I earn my way in this world. But that's not true. If we have a true understanding of the structure of this universe and who our God is, that idea quickly becomes ludicrous. The Bible tells us very clearly that God created everything. We know that. The Bible also tells us that God created us, that he knew us before we were born, that he knit us together in our mother's womb. And the Bible also tells us that God has planned out our lives, has ordained for us good things in advance for us to do. The Bible also tells us that Jesus, who is the Word of God, is the sustainer of all things. That in Jesus Christ, all things move and have their being. Here's a little bit what it's like. When somebody comes up to you and says, Oh, I love your hair. It's so nice. Right? Right? And you go, oh, yeah, thank you. I do have awesome hair, and it's all down to me. I did it. But that doesn't make sense. Because the genetics for your hair came from your parents. You didn't do that. Your parents gave that to you. And your haircut, probably you didn't do it. And if you did do your haircut, we're probably not saying how great it looks. Right? But if you did do your haircut and you were really good at it, even then, let's say, then it would be that God gave you the talent to be able to cut your own hair, which is a talent, right? So God gives you the hair through the genes of your parents. And God gives you the ability to cut your hair. And God gives you the ability to style your hair. And God gives you long-lasting hair, unlike some of us, right? God gives it to you all. None of it is anything that you can claim any credit for. And yet, somebody comes up to you and says, wow, nice hair, right? Or let's say playing music, right? We had, uh, we had three people up here who were playing wonderful music, and it was beautiful, and they have talents, and it's great but where did they get those talents from? From God, right? God may have used various avenues to give them that talent. 
part of it, I don't know, who knows? Maybe it's genetic part of it, I don't know. But God certainly worked in them and knit them together in such a way that they loved music. God gave them a family in which they loved music. God gave them the, the ability and the training to learn about the music or the, the self-discipline to teach themselves music. All of these things come from God. And so if we go up to Cole or Debbie or Ava and we say, wow, that was amazing music. I loved it. It was so good. And they go, yeah, yeah, I know, eh? Yeah. <laughs> totally down to me. That's wrong. Like wrong, not only wrong as in sinful because you're taking all the credit and that's very prideful, but it's wrong as it's incorrect. Right? All that they have been given has been given to them by God. And so if everything we have ultimately comes from God, then why would God honor us? Because really, it's Him who should be honored. Because He did it. Right? It's almost like I make an awesome cake. And somebody goes, wow, cake, you're awesome, and gives all the credit to the cake. That doesn't make any sense, right? But here's the beauty of it. Our God not only gives us life, not only designs us, not only works to plan out our days, not only gives us freely salvation in Jesus Christ, but then God has the gall, the nerve to partner with us, even though everything comes from Him, and to give us credit for good things that he's the instigator and author of in the first place. God loves us so much that he pours out salvation upon us, that he adopts us into his very family with his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, that he sends his Holy Spirit to live within us, that he gives us in advance all kinds of good things to do, and then he says, thank you, well done, good and faithful servant. It's bizarre, and yet it fits perfectly with our gracious and merciful and loving God. God pours out His love upon us in abundance so that our cups overflow. God says to us, I know that really you couldn't possibly have done anything without me. But I also love you. And I value you. And I honor when you give me even the tiniest thing. I treasure it. Think about it this way. When, if you had kids or grandkids or anything like that, when your, your little kid comes home from kindergarten or whatever with a painting, right? The, the reality is, is that, that y you, you brought that kid into the world. You, you gave birth or you were part of the process of giving birth to that child in some way. Um, you, you brought that child into the world. You feed that child. You give that child a home. You provide education for that child. You do all of these things. And the reality is, is that the painting that they brought to you is only possible because you put all these things into place. And yet when that child comes up to you and says, Here, Daddy. Here, Mommy. I made this for you. You don't turn it away and say, yeah, whatever, kid. Everything you have is from me. This is nothing. I gave, I did that. Right? 
You don't do that. You say, oh, that's awesome. Thank you. And you treasure it. And you put it on the fridge. And if you're really good parents, you keep it forever in a scrapbook. Right? God does not despise the tiny gifts that we are able to give to Him. Even though He knows that it would not be possible without Him. Instead, He honors us. Thank you. Thank you. And He makes it possible for us to bring more gifts. And more. And so God honors us. God honors us. Next, we want to look at God's self-controlled nature. So if we move on to the next slide there, we can see that God is self Controlled. This is, of course, part of the Ten Commandments, this passage, where Moses is sharing with the people of Israel the Ten Commandments. And this is in the section where Moses is telling them that God says that they shall not make idols for themselves or bow down to them. And we read in here, You shall not bow down to them, that is, the idols, or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Notice in there that, that and, and sometimes we fixate on this a little bit. I've had conversations with people who, who latch on to this and really struggle with it. There's this part where it says, punishing the sins of the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate you, right? And we think, wow, God is vindictive. Wow, God holds a grudge. Wow, how am I going to get un out from underneath this burden of sin? Am I totally being punished for my father's sins? For my mother's sins? How is that right? And how do I get out from underneath it? Right? We tend to focus on that. And, and there is some real stuff that we need to wrestle with in there. But we forget the next part. We forget where God says, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. A thousand generations of those who love me. Three or four generations, a thousand. It's totally different, isn't it? It's a whole different ball game. There are absolutely consequences and they do sometimes follow generation after generation. But notice the keys there, generations of those who hate me. Right? Those are people who generation after generation are rebelling against God and refuse to repent and follow Him. They are despising God's teaching and they are rejecting God. And God, God will punish them justly and righteously. But if we love God, and seek to follow Him, then He rewards and loves us for thousands of generations. Again, we can go back to Abraham. How many human generations has it been since Abraham? I don't know. A lot. And yet, still, God is showing love to the descendants of Abraham, both physical and spiritual descendants of Abraham. And he is faithful to them. What, think about David, right? God, how many thousands of generations? I don't know. How many generations has it been since David was king? I don't know. 
And yet, God has maintained his love for the David and his offspring. That's why Jesus is the Messiah. That's why Jesus came from the, the line of David. Because God was being faithful and loving thousands of generations of those who loved him. Not because David was perfect, not because Abraham was perfect, not because their descendants are perfect, but because God loves them. Which also means that God is controlling himself in terms of his wrath, his just, righteous wrath. We do not deserve the grace and love that God has shown to thousands of generations of those who love him. The reality is that we really deserve wrath and punishment for thousands of generations of people who hate God. We deserve to have been wiped out. We're going to move on to, uh, i got to skip a couple slides because I already went over that stuff. Move on to uh, the slide that says, we know God forgives, but have you thought about how self-controlled God is? There we go. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. Think about this. If God was not self-controlled, and yet he was holy and righteous and perfect, right? If God was not self-controlled, where would humanity be? Well, I'll tell you, we'd be wiped out way back uh, in Adam and Eve's day. When, when, when God said that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die, we would have died right then and there, and that would have been it. Done with you. But God is self-controlled and so he did not he gave them time yes they did die but not right away and so we have a whole human race almost eight billion of us and so many more that have gone on before because god is self-controlled numerous times when god was when god was dealing with noah and the flood god could have ended humanity there but he did not so many times, time and time and time again, the people of Israel rebelled against God and God could have justifiably said, that's it, we're done. But God controlled himself and did not. Humanity could not exist today if it were not for God's self -control. Humanity would not have gotten grace either if God was not self-controlled. People who are not self-controlled don't extend grace too well. Or maybe they do, but way too late, after things have been done that cannot be undone. If God was not self-controlled, how could he possibly allow his son to go through the suffering that he did for our sake? If I, as a parent, love my child and yet know that they need to go through some form of suffering, if that's true, then, then I need to be self-controlled to allow them to go through that suffering. Otherwise, I go in and rescue them even though I know that they maybe need to do this. Right? God is self-controlled. So what does this all mean for us if we move on? Uh, first of all, uh, again, we must stand in awe. How awesome is it that our God would forgive us. And not only that, but our God would honor us in so many ways when really we know and He knows that we don't deserve it. 
And we must stand in awe of a God who would restrain himself from wiping off us off the face of the earth in spite of our sin and rebellion. And once again, we must bow our heads to the Lord in gratitude. God is so good. And God has forgiven us. And God has controlled his wrath. And God has honored us. What else is there to say other than thank you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? And we must again tremble in fear and gratitude for what God's self-control has meant for us. There's an old saying that we know that we're familiar with, there but for the grace of God go I. You and I, but for God's grace, would receive the full wrath of God. And it would be our end and our undoing. But of course, as in all of this, as we move to the next slide, we need to ask ourselves the question too, what does this mean for how we are to live? Of course, we are to forgive one another. We are to forgive ourselves, because sometimes we are our worst critics. We are a harsher judge of ourselves than God is. And that's a weird kind of twisted arrogance. What? I think I'm a better judge than God is? I don't think so. Right? We need to forgive ourselves. If God has forgiven us, how dare we not forgive ourselves? We need to forgive others. Remember the parable of, of the man who owed his king money. He, he went and asked, begged for forgiveness for that debt. And the, the ruler, the king said, okay, I'll forgive that debt. And then he has the gall, this servant, to go out and, and catch somebody else who owes him a little bit of money and say, that's it, you're going to jail, buddy, and I'm not forgiving you your debt. And of course, the king turns around and says, <laughs> yeah, right. Put him in jail and keep him there until he pays every penny. Right? We are called to forgive just as we have been forgiven. But we are also to receive honors graciously, right? I struggled with this so much for so long, right? When people say, oh, thanks, pastor, that was so great, or whatever, I, I would be like, I don't know what to do with that. And, and maybe you feel the same way, right? People go, oh, that music was so fantastic, or oh, I really appreciate this, oh, you're so talented, you're so kind, you're so compassionate, you're so wonderful. I hope you have to deal with that problem sometimes. If you don't, let me know. I'll throw some good your way, right? But you need to receive it graciously and say, thank you. God is good, right? Yeah. I, I did do great things. A and it's not really ultimately to my credit because really it comes from God. So, thank you. God is good. Right? Thank you. God is good. Receive it graciously, but then also give it out. Right? Give out honors and love. Not disingenuously, not fakely, but give out love and honors. Right? Say that you appreciate this, that, or the other thing about somebody else. And we also need to develop self-control. In human beings, this is not something that comes naturally. We need to develop self-control. Brothers and sisters, as we tremble in fear and gratitude for what God has done for us, we also learn to live as forgiving and honoring and self-controlled people. 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much for giving us salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for being self-controlled and for honoring us in so many ways. Help us, O oh God, to live in your image in these ways as well. In Jesus' name, Amen.